I'm Dr. Orion Taraban, and this is Psych Hacks, Better Living Through Psychology. And the topic of today's short talk is how to stop having panic attacks without medication. This is hard to summarize in just five minutes, so this will be the first of two episodes on the subject. As a psychologist, I've helped dozens of folks stop having panic attacks. The process generally takes two to three months, and it can be done without resorting to anti-anxiety medications. And this is great because those medications, while beneficial in some respects, also come with a host of liabilities and should be used very sparingly, if at all. I've also personally suffered from panic attacks, so I know what they're like, and I know how terrifying and awful the experience can be. I really wouldn't wish them on anybody. And so the strategies that I'm gonna talk about in these videos have worked for me personally, and have worked for many of my patients. So, here goes. What I'd like you to consider is that panic disorder is fundamentally a dysfunction in the mechanism of your attention. It's an attention problem. What do I mean by that? Well, usually the first time you have a panic attack, it seems to come out of the blue, and it's extremely terrifying and upsetting. And after experiencing that, people are understandably anxious about the prospect of the panic attack returning. They don't want it to come back. And since they don't really know what caused the first one, they basically believe that it could return at any moment. So they're kind of constantly on the lookout for signs that the panic attack is coming back. And so what they do is they engage in checking behavior relative to the early onset symptoms of panic attacks. For me personally, my early onset symptom was that my heart would start to race. So my checking behavior was that I would check my pulse a lot. For other people, it's a feeling of being hot. So they check their temperature or feel their forehead. Do you understand? Now, this checking behavior is motivated by a desire to keep us safe, to kind of reassure ourselves that the panic attack isn't happening or to prepare ourselves in the event that it is. But here's the issue with this. What we go looking for, we find. If your doctor performs a number of tests on you, it's highly likely that at least one result will come back abnormal, even if you're otherwise perfectly healthy. So if you go looking for early onset symptoms of panic attacks, you are going to find early onset symptoms of panic attacks. And what makes this even more problematic is that when we pay attention to our natural unconscious physiological processes, we change them. As a way of demonstrating this, I'd like you to take a moment and just notice your breath. You see? You changed the way that you were breathing, whether you wanted to or not. You were breathing smoothly and regularly just a moment ago when your breathing was unconscious. And when you brought your conscious attention to your breath, you changed the way that you were breathing. And this change could be considered an abnormality in the context of your normal functioning. And what makes this most problematic is that when we attend to these changes, we increase the intensity of those changes. I'd like you to consider that attention is like a magnifying glass. Whatever we attend to gets bigger. And the more we attend to it, the more it fills the container of our consciousness and the more that's all we see. And finally, we have the cherry on top. The attribution that this intensified abnormality brought on by our checking is something very negative. It's a judgment, like, oh no, my heart is racing. The panic attack is starting again. I'm having another panic attack. Or even, this is bad, I'm, ha I'm having a heart attack. If you validate this attribution with your belief, then congratulations, you've just given yourself a panic attack. So that's the recipe for a panic attack. We constantly check for signs the panic attack is about to return. In the act of checking, we change our unconscious physiological processes such that they're more likely to now be abnormal. By attending to that abnormality, we increase its intensity. We interpret the meaning of that intensified abnormality in a highly negative light, and finally, we believe our own interpretation is true. So, now you should understand why I call panic disorder an attention disorder. Paradoxically, it's through our efforts to keep ourselves safe that we put ourselves in harm's, in harm's way. And now that we understand what this is, 
I'll talk about more what to do about it in the second part of this talk. What do you think? Remember to like, comment, and subscribe for the algorithm. And if you'd like to schedule a consultation, you can reach me at psychhackspodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.